Hello. Okay, I'm going to be brief because you guys want to hear how to make a bunch of money, but I'm going to thank Michael backstage there for the dice plug. That was, that's always good. Um, but it, we, we kind of came on with the, the, the whole eSports thing, and, and they didn't talk about sort of that being a huge chunk of the market, but it's approaching a billion dollars. And, and I was a huge skeptic a few years ago, and, and I had a colleague, actually an assistant of mine, say, it, the thing is going to be enormous. It's going to drive a lot of uh, design decisions, marketing decisions, um, player participation, fan participation. And, and, and I couldn't imagine this five years ago, <clears throat> people paying to play, traveling to, to watch, uh, paying to watch, that sort of thing. And, and, and you guys probably know these numbers, but League of Legends, last League of Legends finals, um, I could put out Stanley Cup finals and you guys would say absolutely, I'm sure League of Legends finals was bigger than that. But World Series finals, NBA finals, the Masters, it's the, the, the only thing um, bigger at this point is, is Super Bowl and World Cup and, and, and approaching, like I said, a billion dollar business and growing it, not just double digits, but really 30% a year on the revenue side. All the major consumer brands are flocking around, and so there are some opportunities there. And and you know we've got some guys that look at stuff all the time, um, good and bad, and make decisions on on where money's going to be spent. I want to have them introduce themselves: Jason K, Sonny Dillon, and, and Phil Sanderson. Phil, you want to start? Sure. Thanks. Um, so my name is Phil Sanderson, and I'm a venture capitalist. Um, I. Uh, our office is here in the Presidio, and I focus on gaming. Um, I've got about a dozen game investments. Um, I've been in the venture business for almost 20 years and um, have seen a, a big progression of gaming since edutainment and CD-ROM games back in the mid-90s. Um, and uh, I'm excited to talk about eSports today. Hi, guys. I'm Sonny Dillon, uh, co-founder and principal at Signia Venture Partners. Uh, we're an early stage fund based in Menlo Park in San Francisco. Games is an area that I focus on as well. Uh, we have about half a dozen gaming companies in the portfolio right now. Uh, I'm pretty excited about VR, AR, uh, and esports um, right now within the game space and excited to share some thoughts, particularly within esports today. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jason Kay. I'm a relatively newly minted venture capitalist. This is a new uh, engagement for me. I was formerly on the operating side of the games business at Activision, uh, and then with Jason Rubin, uh, worked on trying to revive THQ a few years ago, unfortunately not successfully. Um, been focused a lot on the esports business. Uh, for me, this is a lot of big conversation about why did it take so long? AID invests primarily in Asia. We've just started to branch out into the US. Um, we are a Hong Kong-based private investment firm and we focus primarily on technology, gaming, media, and are looking very closely at the esports opportunity, particularly on esports wagering. So I'm excited to be here today and talk to you a little bit about what we've learned and what we're looking at. Okay, I, I'm going to start off with I had a colleague make a comment that, that esports is it's not a business; it's a, it's a marketing strategy. And, and um, when, you're, when people are spending a billion dollars, uh, there's got to be a business there. But I'd ask you guys to kind of comment there, because you guys look for leverage. I mean, where's the leverage? How can you really grow a business, make some money? And if it's just a marketing strategy, uh, and it's a marketing spend, then, then where is the business? You had mentioned, you, you know, you had mentioned um, maybe gaming, you know? I think when you look at the wagering business, I think esports is likely to develop you know, in a way that's quite similar to the way that we look at professional sports today, football, baseball, basketball. Obviously, esports is highly asymmetrical. You've got a lot of aspirational people who want to be involved in esports but are not necessarily esports caliber players. You've got a relatively small number of elite athletes. It's not really that different from professional sports today. And if you look at where there's significant amounts of money being generated, in the professional sports business, traditional professional sports business, it's obviously team ownership. So I think the analog to that in the US is ownership of the underlying copyrights for people who own the League of Legends and the Counter-Strike Goes and so Valve and, and of course the, the Riot guys, and there will be new entrants. But for the people who don't own the copyrights, there's, I think there's a lot of money to be made facilitating wagering in legal jurisdictions. You've got you know, specific rules in the US related to skill-based games versus games of chance, but in the rest of the world, look outside the US, it's a largely unregulated environment. Um, 
both positively and negatively, unregulated meaning you don't necessarily have the controls and the kind of financial security that you might have in something like does, the Las Vegas. Does that become a platform play? Or something? So, so I actually think that there's, there's something else that we have to consider when it comes to regulation within this space. So we've just all been aware, I think last week, of uh, the betting scandal between DraftKings and FanDuel. DraftKings is now taking bets for the League of Legends World Championship in Berlin. Uh, FanDuel's acquisition of Alpha Draft means that they're going to be um, playing in the space too. And then we've got Vulcan and Unicorn that are more specific to esports. I think that regulation is inevitable because whenever you do have a form of gambling, um, 2006 uh, saw the, um, you know, the Unlawful Internet Gambling Enforcement Act. And we're going to start seeing, I don't think self-regulation is going to be enough. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about how much can this grow, it will grow, but with, uh, within um, a controlled set of uh, um, barriers, I think, in this case. So when you're talking about, is it a means of engagement? Yeah, it is. And it's going to be continued. You know, people can continue to play competitively, but it's going to be within more controlled guidelines when there's betting that comes into play as well. So w where would you look for an investment in that area? Is that, is that in a, come back to a platform, is that a, a systems investment, a platform investment? It's, it's I think there's multiple areas to invest in all different types of categories. This, this especially, people love to play games. Um, they love to watch games. I think there were 70 million people who watched games last year on Twitch. Um, and they love to gamble. So you add those together and you're going to find investment opportunities. Um, we've looked at a lot of different investment opportunities for companies who create platforms for esports games. Um, uh, I think those are somewhat limited. There are, there's team ownership opportunities. There's advertising opportunities. We invested in Alpha Draft because we believed the model of betting on statistics and creating fantasy teams within gaming was a real category, and it is, and it's growing very quickly. Fortunately, FanDuel felt the same way and bought Alpha Draft, as you mentioned, Sonny, and, and DraftKings is there. I think FanDuel and, and uh, DraftKings have really proven that, A, it's legal, and people want to play these fantasy teams um, because they're already watching the games. I mean, we referenced, um, you don't just watch these games like you do NFL, but you can play them as well. So it's really fun to be able to be in you know, an environment like League of Legends and play, and then be able to gamble on your favorite players. I think that's the number one opportunity. There will be advertising opportunities. I don't think that as a venture capitalist, we want to invest in, in um, sponsoring teams. That's, that's more of like a movie model, mm -hmm. and it's pretty risky. But you're right, we want leverage. We want operating leverage, predictability of a SaaS company, um, the growth potential of technology companies, and we find that in models like FanDuel, AlphaDraft, um, you know, uh, DraftKings, Unicorn, Vulcan, and so forth. And I think there's another opportunity that's you know, very high risk and very high reward, and it'll be interesting to see if, if any VC is willing to take the risk or winds up being a, sort of a publisher subsidized risk is, I don't think we've yet seen a game that was designed from the get-go to be an esports vehicle. I think we've got games that work well in that, Dota, League of Legends, which are you know, kind of branches of the same tree. You've got Counter-Strike. You have a really relatively small number of games that people are playing in esports competitions, and I think there's an opportunity, although obviously very, very hard to execute, to build a game that you, you think will work specifically as an esports vehicle, even if it doesn't necessarily work well as a multi a single player vehicle, as a for instance. Yes, yeah, certainly. I've got to believe game designers and, and all the ones I talk to, they think about that. You know, can you get a community involved? And can you do I mean Christian will be speaking here, Tiger Strolly later, I think tomorrow or something, but certainly they think about that when they're working on their game and and, and, and how that works. But um, isn't it just you find a really fun game, you get a huge community, and they want to compete? So I think it's a little bit more than that. You need, um, and there might be an events business around this because you know you've got a championship series and a season, um, but that's at a national, international level. There should be a local season which is put together around all games, um, and and then move to a regional and national level, and you could create, um, you know, like a college going to pro, semi-pro, pro, pro um, because ultimately people love to play these games and, um, and the betting platforms need content. They need people to be able to bet and they also need statistics from those, um, those publishers. You can't just, um, you can't do it alone. You need the... Uh, so you're going to have to partner with those publishers. Ultimately, it can either be through an API or maybe an exclusive relationship, but you need the data 
And also, you need more data than some of these games currently offer. So you need to work with the publishers and say, can we get more statistics on these individuals, on the players, or can you give us access to those stats so that we can create fantasy teams and play in a gambling setting? This is more for the, uh, the gambling you know, opportunity. I think Vainglory's been, Super Evil Megacorp's uh, game, Vainglory's been a great example of um, eSports being built into the game from the start. Like, they've got um, the launch of Vainglory Seasons, which has just kicked off further to what Phil was just saying, organizing tournaments locally, um, getting a lot of support from the company to engage the community, because um, community is really what's helped this game grow um, to where it is now. Um, but I think manufacturing a game from the start with eSports in mind is not necessarily as easy as it sounds. Um, getting access to certain things like replay data, understand when kills and AFKs and all the kind of you know, stats that you want access to, not every game um, is able to provide that just yet. Riot does, and you know, there's certain companies, stats companies uh, out there that build on that, that are used by betting companies, you know, by people that are engaging in betting, et cetera. Um, but I think you're right in that a lot of people are using esports right now as a marketing, you know, as a marketing tool to say, you know, to boost engagement within the community, to um, uh, just harbor more competitive gameplay. So if you were switch seats and you're out here listening, and 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 where if we talk about sort of broader things that you guys would look at, you look for leverage and all the operating leverage, that kind of thing to make some money longer term. It, what's underserved in this area? Um, that if you were an entrepreneur, it might be longer term, um, not something today, but long term. What's underserved or where do you think it's going where someone can take advantage? There's some advertising opportunities. The advertising um, is pretty poor, I believe, within the Twitch, YouTube ecosystems. Um, I think there are content sharing opportunities. You reference replays, being able to edit replays very quickly, share them um, with your friends, add commentary to them, so forth. Um, you know, we, we try to come up with ideas as VCs and share them with entrepreneurs, but what I love about our business is that the entrepreneurial community comes up with the greatest ideas that we can find. Right. <laughs> so uh, it's a good question, but it's not our job. <laughs> there's still some opportunities for knowledge arbitrage. I mean, right now, there's still, it's very segmented. I think there's still things that are working in certain territories and not working. There's no really sort of good cross-platform view of the esports business. You've got, as I said, really very, very small number of games that are working at scale, but there may be games that I'm not aware of that are working in a particular territory and are becoming popular. How do you, how do you find out about those opportunities? I mean, most great games in some ways are derivative of another game. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Candy Crush was not the first person to do effectively a match three, right? Bejewel had been done this before that. I'm sure there were many games who'd done that before that. It's, it's so much about refinement and execution of a good idea. You know, how, what is the opportunity to see where something is working in another territory or with another demographic and then broaden that into some maybe a broader audience? <clears throat> Seeing certain games, so like you do have the staples that we've been talking about, Counter-Strike, Dota, League, et cetera, right, that we all know about. Rocket League is another game that just shot to the top. You know, it's been around, the company's been around since 2004. They had a, um, like a, another version of the game that was circling around for a while, and it's really fun. You know, you're not, I, would I have been able to call that it would have been one to take off? Um, you know, no, it's, that's the nature of the business, right? These, some of these games can continue to, you know, sneak up on you, and you wouldn't, you know, I, I wasn't aware that it was um, rising in esports popularity at the time. I don't think that areas of opportunity, you know, necessarily exist within new streaming platforms at this point. So I think we've got YouTube, Azubu, Hitbox, Twitch, that are already, there's a multitude of, of platforms there for PC. Mob Crush and um, Camcord are offering it on mobile now. I think areas to in further engage your community at the amateur level, um, I think there's some, some interesting opportunities there. There's a company in London named Maestro. Uh, sorry, a company in London named Face It that I've been um, looking at for, for a little while. Um, that does a great job of organizing, laddering, um, you know, engaging community locally at a, like an amateur level. Because right now a lot of focus is on the pros. Um, you know, like, despite how you know, the, the majority of the audience is actually amateurs watching and wanting to play as well. Uh, and then there's other opportunities, I think, to further engage your audience 
um, in a similar way to that YouTube influencers were able to do on the early days of the MCNs. Mm -hmm. Similarly here, I think, whether that's e-commerce opportunities, highly targeted advertising opportunities, um, just a boosted form of engagement between uh, fans and pro professional esports players, influencers. I think that's an opportunity that we're going to start exploring okay. a little more too. Okay. I think and there's one more that hasn't been mentioned, um, which is creator tools. Because I think you've got creators in esports means something different. Obviously, game creators, game developers have a huge, robust suite of tools now to develop the games they develop and between big players like Autodesk, Max Play, Unity. But creators in the esports world can be me narrating a match that happened or re-narrating a match that happened five years ago because I've got a different angle or a different viewpoint. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've seen yet, and there may be examples out there that I'm aware of, of creator tools that really help the individuals, not the professional broadcast, but the hobbyist esports broadcaster get you know, monetization, better production values, distribution, uh, user addition, all of those things. I don't think you've, you've seen yet kind of a class of tools that can help all of the hobbyist esports people who want to be involved, not necessarily as professional players and not necessarily just as spectators, but kind of a middle category. Okay. And, and since we have you here, and I'm going to go off topic because you guys love to go off topic anyway. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm just, just going to throw this out as an open question because you see so much come across your desk. Um, what are you guys, outside of this topic, most excited about from an investment opportunity and, 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 and the industry going forward? For me, it's Tony, VR. Start? Yeah, yeah. Uh, virtual reality, augmented reality is where I've been spending maybe the last six months about you know, 30, 40 percent of my time, um, getting smarter on a space that's been around since the 60s, but you know, it's really come about as a third wave now. So I think we're seeing the market development is going to be a little bit longer than. Um, yeah, do you worry about that being being too early on, on a lot of this? No, because I think the technology is there this time. That's been the difference. Uh, it's not just a lot of sci-fi and you know geek hype, this time the technology is actually there. You know, I'm sure most people in this room have tried a rift and had a, a wow moment when you know, they first did. So I think the technology is really there now. Um, but there's enough big platforms that are actually um, investing very heavily within it, within the space this time to make it a, a reality. Um, mobile first VR with the Samsung Gear is going to be a, you know, a stepping stone to some uh, truly more immersive uh, gaming opportunities, I think, um, specific to the audiences here. So yeah, very excited about it. Um, I don't, to answer the question though, I don't think it's too early this time. Okay, you know, Phil, you were, I overheard you in the back, though, yep. thinking it might be too early. Well, I think, uh, I've been looking at VR companies since the mid 90s, literally, and um, technology's come a long way. It's an incredible experience, and it is absolutely the future. Um, and our, you know, our jobs as VCs is to figure out when is the right time to invest in the cycle. Um, what you don't want to do in any cycle is to invest a little bit too early, even you know, two to three years too early, because the amount of money it takes to build a team, to build up, put out a product, um, you can lose that in a very short amount of time, and then you know, if you lost your investment. So I'm waiting for the right time when that cycle hits. I feel like we're maybe two years away, maybe three, from um, investing in publishers and, and developers in the category from a VC perspective. But, um, but who's to know? Is it, is it uh, and, and, and would your first investments be tools, tools, that kind of thing, or, or, or would it be content? I think it would be content. I mean, you asked what, the, what, what I'm most interested in. Um, I like IP-based content publishers, and um, we made a number of investments in that category. Telltale Games is one that I've been on the board for the last eight years, and they published Game of Thrones, um, Walking Dead. So Minecraft Story Mode is coming out tomorrow, um, which is going to be a huge game on all platforms. And um, Minecraft is one of the most popular IPs in history. And um, you know, Telltale knows how to make great games. It's going to be really exciting. Next Games, another company where I'm on the board, is based in Helsinki. They came out with um, AMC's The Walking Dead, No Man's Land, last Thursday. It's, it's number one in the App Store today on iPad and iPhone. And it's really fun and exciting. Walking Dead is the top title on television today. Um, these games market themselves, really solve the CPI issue in many senses, and it's what people want, they want to play. So I like finding publishers who know how to make great games out of great IP. To me, that's a low-hanging fruit in our category. 
I think in addition to AR and VR, which I've been incredibly impressed in how rapidly things have progressed. I remember when Jason Rubin and I went to see Oculus when they had just uh, released DK1. And you know, my sort of takeaway was great. This is really early. I spent half an hour playing Half-Life. I spent you know, six and a half hours lying in bed, uh, completely nauseated. <laughs> and said, you know, this is, I kind of see it, but I, I'm one of the least motion sensitive people that I know. If I can't handle this experience, even playing Half-Life at pretty slow pace, this is probably a long way from mainstream. And then sort of fast forwarding nine months ahead where they, you know, solved the bulk of those problems. Um, the other thing that we're doing that's, I think, sort of a traditional or not, not traditional, we, we've tended to invest in certain cases directly in content. So we're looking at what I'd call formats rights opportunities. Um, not sort of just standard localization of games or television or movies where you kind of take it from the US to Asia, but actually looking at the concept and saying, does the concept of uh, Game of Thrones, for lack of a better example, work, but we want to do a localized version for this region with Thai actors, a Thai-focused storyline that maybe ties into something that's going to be much more, you know, much more accessible to that audience. So we've actually looked at remakes, and we've just done one deal, which we haven't announced. Um, which I'm pretty excited about in the kind of remaking something that worked well in the US and then going to completely change it, probably 90 degrees almost, mm -hmm. to make it work in another market. And Sonny, you were nodding when I mentioned tools versus content. Is it, is it comment there? So, so I think that's actually a pretty good hedge around how long the community does, sorry, the, uh, the VR community takes to really kick off um, because direct to consumer monetization models are a ways off. You know, spending $1,000 on an Oculus-ready PC is still you know, a ways off for the majority of uh, the world to, to go about. I do think that um, content creation tools in the early days of a new platform are a pretty good bet when you know, there's a lot of content funding right now um, coming out of, you know, of Oculus, um, from Sony, uh, from HTC, and from some of the other heads headset makers. Um, I think that investing in tools right now, as a lot of the, co the, the content that's out there will get burned through pretty quickly. I think the jaunt uh, Disney deal that recently happened is you know, getting more capital to kind of scale up production and you know, put out more of these four, five, seven minute mobile first experiences. Um, content creation tools, for example, we, we, there's one that we haven't announced yet, but that works within um, you know, being able to create better light field technology, being able to create um, uh, content that looks more realistic, more photorealistic, more immersive. Investing in these kind of tools at the beginning, as there's a surge in demand for right. content on these new platforms, these kind of tools are going to become pretty pervasive. I guess that hedges bets, too. I'm take it to training, but to take it to, to just visual experiences outside of the game community as well. I mean, I, I went through, everybody's probably done all the demos, but. Uh, the last HTC Valve demo I went through is I would not step off that bridge, even though hmm. it's easy to, you know, go ahead, step off the bridge. But I don't like heights anyway. There's no way I'm going to do that. And yeah, most people can't do it, I think. Oh, yeah. And, and mentally, immediately, I go to, you know, I don't really want to go to Cairo right now, but would I want to, you know, go VR-wise? It'd be great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anything else? I always like to kind of, we've got two minutes here, and, and maybe it's just my own voyeuristic sort of look at things, but uh, I have a friend that's a VC up in Seattle, and he loves his cocktail stories about how he missed Jeff's pitch with Amazon, and, and he goes, yeah, he'll sell a few books, but he's talking about owning the, the, the sort of retail environment everywhere, plus technology, and he's crazy, and, and he did the same thing with Starbucks, and so I always like to, and you know, he doesn't care, you know, he. He's hit other places, but I always like to ask because I'm curious. What have you missed, and 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 why do you think you missed it? And is there any lessons in that, if you're willing to share? <laughs> I don't think two minutes could cover. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's too the amount of things the I look back in hindsight that seems so <laughs> obvious. Yeah. I know. I, w I would add, though, that I mean, talking about VR as a new category, I think something I would encourage people to really focus on is cloud gaming, which I think is happening in the next, again, you know, the next two to three years. I think that Apple TV will replace the, the Xbox and Sony PlayStation in the living room. Um, I'm really excited about it in general. I think we've got a little ways to go technology-wise, just like we have a little ways to go in VR, but those are two categories I'm really looking forward to, and uh, we'll be definitely making investments in. Great, great. Well, thank you very much.
Thanks. All right.